If you're feeling overwhelmed about writing a birth plan, today we're going to cover what you actually need to include and what you don't need to worry about. Welcome back to Every Mama's Midwife. If you're new, my name's Jess. I'm a certified nurse midwife and infertility mom, and I just had my second baby 11 days ago. I actually didn't write a birth plan for my first birth, okay. and there were a few things that didn't go quite the way I wanted them to, so I did write a birth plan this time around. I also wrote a separate hospital transfer plan, which I think is a good idea if you're planning a home birth. Okay. I do think writing a birth plan is more important if you're planning a hospital birth, just because there's usually a wider variety of different providers who could be on call for you, and you're going to be meeting your primary support person, your labor nurse, for the first time, you know, obviously aside from like your husband, partner, mom, whoever is going to be with you in labor. It's helpful to break your birth plan down into two parts, labor and postpartum. The most important thing to include in the labor section is what your plans are for pain management and what suggestions you're open to. I always tell my patients if they're planning to avoid pain medication, they can write, don't ask me to rate my pain, because if you're in the hospital, the nurses are required to ask you to rate your pain on a scale of one to 10. But if you're planning on avoiding pain medication, that's just not helpful. You can also say things like, don't offer me an epidural unless I ask about it, or don't offer it unless I say this special code word. The biggest mistake I see with a lot of birth plans is that they include a lot of things that are standard of care in most hospitals. Things like, I don't want an episiotomy, I don't want forceps, um, don't do a C-section unless it's absolutely necessary. Your provider knows you don't want those things and they don't want those things for you either. Anytime they would consider one of those interventions, that should be a discussion between you and your provider. Even in a true emergency, we need your verbal consent before we do any of those things. If you do have specific concerns about some of those interventions, then I would recommend talking to your healthcare provider about it ahead of time. And you can ask things like, what's your C-section rate? What's your episiotomy rate? I love it when patients ask me how often I do episiotomies and I can say I've done one in the last six years. But those types of things don't really need to be in your birth plan. It just makes it longer than it needs to be. The other important thing to include in the labor section would be any special requests you have of staff especially pertaining to visitors. So like if you don't want your mother-in-law in the room anytime you have your cervix checked, you can totally put that on your birth plan and the nurses are more than happy to be the bad guy and kick people out of the room. Oh, honey. And while the nurses are more than happy to be the bad guy for you, if there are people you don't want at the hospital, my advice is just don't post on Facebook or social media that you're at the hospital. Tell people after you're already home. Bye. You will have to excuse baby August. We are in that witching hour of the evening where he cluster feeds and then nothing makes him happy. The postpartum section of your birth plan should include any desires you have for baby after birth, things like what routine newborn medications you do or do not want, uh, desires for delayed cord clamping, things like that. And delayed cord clamping is standard of care for most delivering providers, meaning that once your baby's born, we don't clamp and cut the cord immediately after birth. Usually we wait a few minutes so baby can get some of the cord blood, but every provider does it a little bit differently. So I usually wait until the cord stops pulsing, but I know one of the OBGYNs I work with waits for two minutes before she clamps and cuts the cord. And there's a family practice provider I work with who only waits for like I don't remember if it's 30 seconds or 60 seconds before clamping and cutting the cord. So if you like specifically want it to be delayed a specific amount of time, I would put that in your birth plan. And it's okay to, um, to remind the provider at delivery. So as a midwife, having her second baby at home, this is what I included in my plan. First, I put to please encourage me to switch positions and use positions that don't feel great. If things are taking a while, please remind me to sit backwards on the toilet. And this is because with my last birth, I kept wanting to do things that felt better and it made my birth take a really long time. Um, and I had also gotten stuck at like nine and a half centimeters for a while. And I think if I would have sat backwards on the toilet, it would not have been stuck at that point for that long. With this labor, I was only in labor for six hours and basically everything hurt because my water had broken before my labor started. And at one point my husband did say like, oh, hey, you, you wanted me to encourage you to do things that hurt. And I just like snarled at him like everything hurts right now. So, but I did, I did do the things that hurt. Um, and for me this time it was laying down on my side, which also hurt last time. Um, I mean, really, that was the big thing, because if I sat up, my contractions spaced out, which is exactly what happened with my last labor, too. And so when I did need a break with this labor, I sat up for a while. Um, but then I got to the point where I was ready to push and, and sitting up didn't stop that from happening. Next, I put don't encourage me to eat. Last time I vomited everything I tried to eat in labor, but coconut water stayed down. This time, coconut water and regular water uh, came up, too. I could not keep anything down in labor, but fortunately, it was a really quick labor. 
Third on my list, I said, I don't want to push until I'm spontaneously pushing and can't stop. Even if I have a persistent anterior lip, I'd rather try to reduce it with position changes. I don't want to have it held back or try to push past it because that was something my midwife did with my last birth because I'd been stuck at an anterior lip or nine and a half centimeters for about two hours. This time I was not stuck at, at nine and a half centimeters. I thought I was for a while, but it turned out I wasn't as far along as I thought. Um, but when she checked me and told me I was nine and a half centimeters this time, I was like, I don't care. I'm pushing. But fortunately, she didn't have to hold the lip back. It, it reduced over the baby's head. So it, it just didn't matter. Oh, next I said, I will announce the sex of the baby. I announced it to my husband last time just because I have seen way too many dads go, it's a boy, when actually it's a girl because with baby genitals, they're really swollen from the mom's hormones at birth. So a lot of times baby girls will have really swollen labia and, and dads will sometimes mistake them for testicles. And I didn't want my husband to make that mistake this time because everything hurt so bad um, and because I tore and I just needed to catch my breath after birth, like I didn't even want to look at the baby for the first several seconds after he was born. Um, and so the midwives just had my husband announce it, but he announced it correctly. <laughs> so next I said, I'm sure Matt will be on top of this, but please remind us to take pictures once baby is born. Last time we transferred to the hospital without getting any pictures of me and baby, even if I'm naked. And my husband recorded the birth and he took a ton of pictures after delivery this time. Like that was his, his main job. Finally, I said, please give me a shot of Pitocin after baby is out and don't forget I have a marginal cord, just meaning that I did want to do active management of third stage, uh, meaning that I wanted Pitocin to help get the placenta out just because I had to retain placenta last time. Unfortunately, the shot of Pitocin didn't do anything to help get the placenta out. Um, and then the marginal cord is just to remind the midwives not to pull too hard on the cord when trying to get the placenta out because it's more likely to pop off because the cord was inserted towards the side of the placenta rather than the middle. And then the last thing I had put was if we transfer and it's Friday, please remind us to light candles first just because our family is Jewish and we observe Shabbos and we do prayers on Friday night. And my daughter had been born on Shabbos and we forgot to light candles and say prayers before we left to the house for the hospital and we forgot again this time. In my hospital transfer plan, I mostly included things about like, here's what happens if I need to have a C-section, here's what happens if I need to get my placenta out um, in the operating room. And that was only gonna be used if I couldn't transfer to my hospital with my OBGYN for any reason. The hospital that I work at actually decided to stop doing um, births about six weeks prior to my due date, which was absolutely devastating for me. Um, they had decided to consolidate delivery services with our sister hospital, which is actually about 30 minutes from my house rather than 12 minutes from my house. And so I wasn't sure if my OBGYN would be able to manage me at our hospital. Fortunately, since the baby was out, she was. If I had still been pregnant, I would have had to transfer to another hospital though in the event of a transfer. And so I just included things like if I'm in the operating room and I have to be put to sleep, please have the baby go skin to skin with my husband. Um, if I have to have a C-section and I'm able to be awake, I don't want the baby to go to the warmer. I want the baby to go straight to my chest if it's doing okay, things like that. So there you have it. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. Honestly, I, I'm not sure. I guess I probably will write a birth plan with my third birth. At this point, we're thinking if we're fortunate enough to have another baby, we would probably give birth in a hospital next time just because I've had two home births now. I've had retained placentas and had to transfer to the hospital both times. I think odds of having another retained placenta are really high, especially if it's an anterior placenta because both of my placentas have been anterior and have gotten you know really stuck in that area. Um, so it would be a whole different ball game, a whole different birth plan next time. I also was so stressed out the last week of my pregnancy going like past my due date. Honestly, if we're planning a hospital birth next time, I might ask to be induced at 40 weeks. Like I was just so stressed at the end and this baby was so huge. He was nine pounds, 12 ounces. So I don't know, maybe ask for a growth scan at the end of pregnancy. I, it, it's going to be a couple of years before I can even think about that and wrap my head around the, the idea of being pregnant again because, oh my gosh, <laughs> was this birth a doozy. So coming up, we'll be talking about why we're not circumcising, even though our family is Jewish. I definitely want to do a breastfeeding video. Fortunately, it's been going so much better this time around, but I really, really struggled with my first baby. And I think I have learned a lot along the way. Um, and have a lot to offer on that topic. So if you think that might be interesting to you, make sure to subscribe and turn on the notification bell so you don't miss those videos. Thank you so much for watching.